everyone, this is Hannah and Kaylin, back again with Double Talk Asks. One of the first signs that the world had changed in the wake of the pandemic came around this time last year, when movie theaters closed and stayed closed. Now, 13 months on, theaters are beginning to reopen and TV and film production has begun again. But the question remains, are things really going to return to normal? Will we still be seeing effects of the shutdown months or even years down the line? If anyone can give us an informed answer to this question, it's the assistant editor of RogerEbert.com, Matt Fagerholm, who knows movies better than pretty much anyone. Today on Double Talk Asks, we're diving into a simple question with a much more complicated answer. How will the pandemic affect the future of the film industry? Since the beginning of the pandemic, there's been so much discussion, like when the movie theaters started to close and production started to shut down, people were asking, is this going to affect the film industry in the long run? And even now, things are starting to open up again, movie theaters are opening, you see people back on set. But even as everything continues to open back up and go back to normal, so it seems, will there still be lingering effects of the pandemic in the long run, even maybe years down the line? It's so difficult to give a conclusive answer because really everything has to have an asterisk right now in terms of, you know, we, we don't really know. There are no absolutes, you know, in terms of where we're going to be headed. But I think we, there's always been, even before the pandemic, this fear that something was going to be overtaking the movie going experience in terms of in theater. You know, audiences actually showing up to the theater. And I covered the Academy Awards for the past three years in the press room. And I remember all the buzzing that was happening when a film like Roma was, was getting all of these nominations of beautiful film that Alfonso Cuaron did. And, uh, but people were saying, but this was released exclusively on Netflix. And what's going to happen when films on Netflix are, completing with, are, are competing with films that are being released exclusively to theaters? And so, you know, and people like Spielberg, who obviously loves the movie going experience and the audience experience. He was very much backing a, a film like Green Book that was released in theaters and eventually won the Oscar that year. And uh, there, there still is very much a favoring for films that are rolled out the traditional way. But a, a film like Roma, for example, wouldn't have had wouldn't have been able to be the film it was had it been released by a major studio that was you know focused on the theaters. It was that Netflix gave them full creative reign to make the film they wanted to make, and that's why it was so good was because of the streaming platform. So I see streaming platforms and theaters kind of still existing, but in a parallel space where it's, it, it allows more options depending on what story you want. So I'm feeling like weirdly optimistic at the moment, but I might feel different in a week, you know? <laughs> it's... Yeah, like you said, no one really knows. But it's interesting because yeah. you were kind of talking about the pros of, of using a, of a film being released on a streaming service. But then there are also, I've seen producers in the last year just wanting to hold off for that big theatrical release. Why might a studio want to hold that film and, and not go for the streaming release and, and make sure that it's seen in theaters, even if you have to wait longer for it? It's a good question. And it's, I mean, I think studios are still scrambling to figure out what is the best method here, because you have Warner Brothers that was seen as the champion for in theater releases with Christopher Nolan's Tenet last year. Now they're the ones saying like basically our whole 2021 calendar is going to be released simultaneously in theaters and uh, streaming. And, and what we're seeing that happen right now with Godzilla versus Kong, where everyone was like, well, this is the end of the movie going experience in theaters where everyone's just going to watch. And now this film is now becoming the golden beacon of hope for uh, movies moving forward in terms of in theaters, because this has grossed uh, right now, like well over $350 million worldwide. And uh, so it's the highest grossing film of the pandemic era. And so they're hoping, but the, nothing's really else is really making money though. It's really only that film that's making significant enough money to make people hopeful that this will be moving forward uh, in theaters uh, as well as streaming. Because I mean, I watch Godzilla versus Kong on a small screen. I'm not fully vaccinated yet. I'm not going back to the theater until I'm fully vaccinated. That's just my you know, particular choice. But, uh, but people didn't want that. They're like, I don't want to see Godzilla and Kong fighting out and all these amazing action scenes on a tiny little screen. I want to get that full popcorn movie going experience. And you have Brian Tyree Henry in there. I think it's probably the best of the new Godzilla films because he's in there being irreverent and funny. And it is more of an audience movie, I feel, than the previous ones in the franchise. So it's, uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it with an audience once I'm you know, fully vaccinated. 
Are there any actual benefits for a film that was meant to have a theatrical release being released on a streaming service? Or is it more just, this is the best we can do right now? Um, gonna have to just release it on a streaming service because we can't wait any longer? It is the, the best situation money-wise for the studios they can do right now. We want to make as much money as possible, so we want to have these two options. We want to respect people's choice of not, you know, risking their lives going to the theater before they're vaccinated and all that. So I think it's really more that. I don't know if, if major studios are going to be doing that very much in the future. But as we see with Disney Plus, uh, the opportunities they've been giving people in terms of you can stream this, you know, you have to pay a certain amount of money, about $30 to see. That's what I actually paid to see the new Mulan film. What am I actually going to go that extra length to pay that inflated price for just to watch it on my television? But I don't really see that moving forward in terms of, you know, once things open up, I think it'll get less and less of the major studio films. Again, this is just my guess, but major films on that platform. And the best thing this has done really, uh, you know, the, 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 the silver lining, of course, of the pandemic, which has been horrendous, has been uh, you, uh, art house films, smaller films have gotten so much more focused than they would have otherwise. The film that's basically the front runner for best picture now, uh, Nomadland with Francis McDormand, that's about people who choose to be nomads and living on the fringes of society. And this is a film that could have so easily been uh, just uh, confined to just a few art house theaters. But now that everyone's streaming, everyone's looking at this content, I think it's gotten so much bigger of an audience than it would have otherwise. And I mean, streaming is really just becoming, that is the place for art house cinema moving forward. Do you see at, at any, any point in the future um, movie theaters becoming obsolete? People say drive-ins now, it's kind of like a novelty thing, whereas back in the day it was something that everybody did. Do you think that movie theaters could potentially one day ever have that same fate where it's not like, oh yeah, a movie comes out, you go to the theater to see it? I sure hope not. It, it, it's a great question. I, I have a good friend of mine. He gave me one of my first jobs in high school, Scott Dean, who runs the McHenry Outdoor Theater, which is way north of uh, Chicago. And that's the only movie going experience I had during the pandemic was he was showing old films and they were doing it very particularly. You could only have a car one every other parking space and people had to keep socially distanced and wear masks when they're outside their car. And they were showing classic movies. I saw The Wizard of Oz and E.T. And it was a wonderful experience to at least still have that. So it is a novelty, but I, I think drive-ins, that has been like our last hope for the communal experience during the pandemic. So I, I do respect that as an option, but oh boy, I really do hope that we will always have the theatrical movie going experience moving forward in some degree. I think people have been saying, you know, this will be for more of like an elitist and I hope not elitist thing, but, but you're gonna have to pay more money and there's gonna be less seats because we need the, we need the seats that do the reclining and that, you know, mm -hmm. give you like a massage while you're sitting there. I don't need all that, you know? I love the theaters where everyone's kind of together in comfortable enough seats, but everyone's together and we're all strangers in a room having this amazing shared experience. We have a, a venue in Chicago called the Music Box Theater that do, does this uh, 70 millimeter festival of all these amazing films and uh, ultra clarity. They bring in even an even bigger screen. And my fiance and I, that was the last film, like big film we saw before the pandemic was West Side Story in 70 millimeter. And people were applauding after the musical numbers and they were so just into it. And nothing, no matter how good of a TV you have or how many friends you invite over, nothing is going to replicate the experience of all these strangers in a room being unified by just like that shared experience, all laughing and, and cheering together. I know. I really don't want that to go away. I know. <laughs> Ever. What, um, what, all, what is your all time uh, most memorable movie theater experience where the experience itself in the theater, like you mentioned with West Side Story, made the experience that much more memorable? For us, it was that pin drop silence and the credits at the end of American Sniper, very memorable. They were, everyone oh, stood up, walked out, got up out of their seats, walked all the way down, left the place, not a single sound. Single out. It was amazing. I'll never forget that. Do you have an experience like that that stands out where it's like, if I wasn't in the theater, then this would have been completely different um, and a completely different experience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's so many. And in, in college, I was part of an American Pavilion program. You had to pay to attend the Cannes Film Festival for two weeks. And you stayed in like, like the tent. You worked at the American tent of the, the American Pavilion, and then you scrounged for tickets at night. But I got to see one of the very first screenings of No Country for Old Men with an international audience. And you're in this massive theater where everyone's speaking different languages all around you. And then the movie starts and everyone's reacting in unison. You can see how visual storytelling is, is just the language that 
that unites us all. And you know, it got to a scene where Javier Bardem is giving this monologue. I don't know if you've seen the film where it's a very like a sinister monologue to this guy and he's flipping a coin and he's basically deciding his fate in that moment in this convenience store. And people watched it. And as you said, you could hear like a pin drop watching the scene because everyone's on edge. And then as soon as that scene ended, people applauded like they're at some live theater event. <laughs> it was just, I sat there, I'm like, well, this guy's gonna win the Oscar. And then he did, he did win. <laughs> Can you imagine being in the theater for Primal Fear? The, the clapping, there's so many movies oh, yeah. where I look back and I'm like, wow, that would have been great. Oh yeah. There's so many big studio films that keep getting pushed back and back and back, sometimes multiple times because of this pandemic. What does that do as far as the audience's interest in the film? Does it kind of build suspense and build excitement having been pushed back so many times or do people kind of drop off and lose interest at that point? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, and it's a different scenario for every given film. It was so right. funny. I don't know if you saw the, the BAFTAs they aired last night. You can stream the whole thing on YouTube apparently. And they had a whole montage of all the films that have been held up for a year that will eventually be coming to theaters this year. And I was like, man, it looks like Emily Blunt's like in every movie. She had a busy <laughs> year three years ago <laughs> yeah. at this point. <laughs> it's just crazy. And I mean, she is in A Quiet Place Part Two. That was one of the very first films to be completely stalled because of the pandemic. And that whole film is about this, you know, encroaching fear and paranoia. And you, you wonder like, are people gonna wanna sit through that after being, you know, through the pandemic and the paranoia? Yeah. Well, it depends on how people enjoy horror films. It's like, for some people they're like, I don't wanna go through a, suspenseful experience after the last year that we've had. And for other people, it's like, well, there's a catharsis because I'm watching a fictional story on the screen and we've survived this experience and we can all, you know, sort of a, you know, appreciate that together. What you just said made me kind of think of a moment that's going to be nice, actually. You talk about community after everyone's been through this experience together. Imagine the first time a, a bunch of people in the theater for the first time together at once. Yeah. You know, like maybe, maybe we're all experiencing our first movie since the pandemic at the same time, which is actually something to look forward to. And nice idea. I'll just say too how streaming services have opened up the narrative options in terms of how we consume narratives. I mean, you're in one of my favorites of recent years, Maniac. That was, uh, you know, just crossing the genres. It was such an amazing grab bag of things that if you pitched that to a movie studio and had to be condensed to two hours, it would be almost impossible. You can't even imagine that film getting made any other way than a miniseries on Netflix. And I, I think that is another reason why it's just such a, I think people are just going to be more creative. I mean, if, if major studios particularly want to stay afloat, I think they should be open to taking more risks in terms of the type of stories they tell and how they tell them. And, you know, something like maniac that's pushing the boundaries and how we tell narratives. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's raising the bar. I hope that's what studios will do. They'll realize, well, you have to actually take more risks in storytelling in order to, you know, keep people in the theaters. You know what I was just thinking too? Um, I guess you can kind of compare, like, I'm thinking about Schitt's Creek because I'm a huge fan of Schitt's Creek. There, yeah, there's so many people who didn't know about Schitt's Creek. It was like a little hidden Canadian show. And then when it hit Netflix, a streaming service, that's when it got this whole new wave of fans. And I think it was after they wrapped, they got like this whole yeah. new audience of people so I guess that's kind of the same thing where if something's on a streaming service you might not have seen it in the theater or you might not have tuned into CBC somehow when you're in America but now that it's on Netflix it's, it's more easily accessible you're gonna watch it and then you see things that you wouldn't have normally seen. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was the show of the pandemic. That was the show we all needed during the pandemic. And it's about people stuck in a situation they don't want to be in. Stuck in this room. Yeah. They all have to be forced into that place. And then they all come out of it better people. It was a soul cleansing experience. It was like, if we're stuck in this place and we're stuck here because we have to maintain safety and the health of others, we can somehow work on ourselves and make ourselves better for the experience. That's what, that's what my mindset's been, you know?